Hello everyone and welcome to the Speculative Wildlife Research Center, where we reimagine creatures and monsters from all realms of fiction through the lens of speculative biology. Today we will be going back to our world of dragons, taking a look at the first modern clade of these amazing groups, the drakes. Drakes are usually defined as being four-legged, non-winged dragons and that description will essentially be translated one-to-one -one for our video. As some of the most ancient examples of creatures modernly called dragons, they will work great for beginning this series proper, giving us a look at creatures more similar to those of our own world before we dive fully into the kind of legendary monsters we might be more familiar with. For now, let's take a look at the drakes exemplified through the biology of a specific legendary dragon and see what these creatures would be like as real living animals in a world where dragons evolved alongside mankind. Also, if there is any other species of drake you would like to see in the show, please mention it in the comments below. I would gladly return and do a shorter episode on another drake to further deepen our understanding of the clade. If you haven't watched the first video, in which I introduced the first ancestors of dragons and the setting we will be working on, I'd recommend you see it to get better context on the biology and evolution of these creatures as we go forward. Also, if you are enjoying this series so far, please consider supporting the channel on Ko-fi, link available in the video's description. Now, without further ado, let's get started. Not long after the ancestors of dragons first emerged from the destruction of the KPG extinction, life already buzzed and bustled with the potential of evolution. Dragons themselves soon took to the deepest oceans and the cloudless skies, taking on as many shapes as there were chances at preying on other animals. Some dragons, however, stayed on land, never straying too far from the body plan that had brought them such success. They grew in size, in power and speed, but remained tethered to the ground as their ancestors were. Thus was born Order Terradraconis, the creatures we know as drakes. The fossils of some of the oldest species of drake show these creatures first appeared around the Middle East before expanding north towards Europe and west towards India. Nowadays, drakes are still confined to Eurasia, mostly around tropical and temperate areas, but after the Ice Age, some drake species adapted to life as far north as the Scandinavian peninsula and as high as the Alps. Their expansion, however, is limited wherever they find too much competition or even predation, from creatures such as worms and flying dragons. The species we are seeing today is considered a great model organism for drakes. The predator scientifically denominated as Ruvervenator ferox, but named by the ancient Mesopotamians as Mushusu. These creatures inhabit the territory of modern-day Iraq and surrounding countries remaining quite close to the place drakes first evolved. While drakes are the modern dragon clade morphologically closest to their ancestors, animals such as Mushusu clearly display the diagnostic characteristics of the order. They are four-legged, terrestrial carnivores adapted to chasing down prey. Their head is proportionally bigger and more massive than that of their ancestors, adorned with a frontal crest that helps them dissipate heat and small, blunt, bony growths near the back of its lower jaw, involved in sexual selection along with distinctive seasonal coloration of the throat. They tend to have a furry coat, evolved from the feathers of their ancestors, that protects them from outside weather conditions but its density and extension varies a lot between genera. While it's usually pretty dense in species adapted to colder climates, such as the tadzel worm or the fafnir, 
or in species from wetlands or marshes, such as the European Velu or the Giaolong, in species from dry places, like the Mushusu, this coat is notably light, better adapted to its environment. This layer of fur is quite short in the drake's underside, allowing it to lose heat more efficiently, but fur will be denser on its back and neck, protecting it from direct sunlight. In some species, this fur coat also works as an ornament or camouflage. The Mushusu's reddish color, for example, helps disguise it among the rocks and sand of its natural habitat, where it will lay down as it stalks its prey, before running it down in a burst of speed. This creature, like most drakes, has a flexible spine, long legs and a tail that acts as a counterweight, helping it achieve great speeds and fast turning while it hunts and a fast movement from its long neck seals its prey's fate. As all drakes, the Mushusu catches prey using its head, trapping prey with a strong bite. Its relatively short muscle, aided by powerful muscles, gives it the necessary strength to crush its prey's neck and kill it almost instantly. Afterwards, it will use its sharp claws to tear its prey apart before ripping huge chunks of flesh with its mouth. Being the biggest land predators in their environments, drakes are capable of feeding on almost anything they find, but their particular hunting style veers them towards specific types of prey. While some smaller species will feed on fish and other freshwater fauna, some of the biggest species such as the Indian Nongshaba, have been reported as hunting rhinos and even adult elephants on occasion. The Mushusu will mostly feed on camels, goats, gazelles and deer, not being adverse to carrion should it cross its path. While such creatures are capable of fighting back in desperation, kicking at its captor with their strong legs, the drake will be protected by the presence of scutes in its skin. As tends to happen with big predators such as these, drakes have often found themselves clashing with other apex predators. While they have completely outcompeted mammalian carnivorans, large colonies of Homo sapiens have turned out to be a much hardier opponent. Indeed, some of the most ancient tales of human civilizations already tell of the vicious attacks by these predators, and even nowadays, human populations are accosted by drakes. While lone humans may fall prey to the Mushusu every once in a while, it is much more common for them to hunt creatures that already resemble their natural prey, such as sheep and cattle. As such, species of drake that live near human settlements have had their numbers reduced by poaching and revenge killings in response to the death of humans and their livestock. In particular cases, certain species of drake, and of dragons in general, have been subject to systematic exterminations, leaving them critically endangered. Nowadays, with a better understanding of their importance to the ecosystem, population recovery programs and natural reserves have allowed dragons to recover. However, human and dragon populations still clash around rural areas where it is harder to stop dragons from hunting humans and to stop humans from killing dragons. In contrast, despite the reality of their uneasy coexistence with humans, dragons have often been recognized as strong, majestic beings. More than once, certain species of dragon, especially flying or land-dwelling dragons, have been tied with kings, either by being given the title of kings of nature and animals, or by being named and used as icons by human kings. In modern times, dragons still adorn flags and banners, notably being among the only extant animals depicted alongside legendary and fantastic creatures, such as phoenixes or leopards.
And that's it for a speculative biology look into drakes. Back when I released the teaser for the first video, lots of people guessed something like this would come somewhere down the line quite soon. When I was first thinking about how to organize dragons into their own evolutionary tree, drakes, with their four-limbed, wingless body, logically leapt forward as the best choice for the most basal dragon, the one closest to the ancestor of them all. And that works amazingly, since this means dragons known by some of the oldest cultures, including the one considered the cradle of modern civilization, are also some of the most ancient dragons in our setting, neatly tying the real history of mankind with the evolution of dragons. Something I leaned on for this video is that creatures such as these would quite naturally take a place in their ecosystem very close to that of big felines, outright replacing them as apex predators. Thinking about drakes as that type of predator allowed me to visualize very clearly how such creatures would move and live in their own world, and then to accommodate all creatures that could be classified as drakes in this order. Now, next time we come back to this series, we will begin going weirder in terms of anatomy, as we explore what other shapes will clade draconide take in the future. If you have any ideas for dragons that could show up in this series, or any creatures you would like me to give the speculative biology treatment in the show, please sound off in the comments below. Thank you all for watching, and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Research Center.